This is Dr. Gillespie back with Spatial Interaction Chapter 3. Yes, we're saving Chapter 2 for after we already have learned about this chapter because Chapter 2 is culture and there's so much ethnicity, um, all kinds of things about language and um, artifacts, things of culture that we want to delve into. Uh, so we're, we're going to spread culture out for several weeks. So let's jump into spatial interaction for chapter three. Spatial interaction is the flow of products, people, services, and information among places in response to localized supply and demand. It is a transportation supply and demand relationship that we often express over a geographical space. Spatial interactions usually include a variety of movements, movements such as travel, migration, migration of people, transmission of information, journeys to work or to go shopping, retailing activities, or freight distribution. Edward Ullman was a famous geographer, and uh, his specialty was transportation geography in the 20th century. And he more formally addressed interaction as complementarity, transferability, and lack of intervening opportunity. This was his idea and has been widely spread and believed. <clears throat> Complementarity is a deficit of a good or product in one place and a surplus of that same product in another place. So for two places to interact, one place must have a supply, I'm trying to read what you are seeing, of an item for which there is no effective demand. An example that is used here, uh, it's a bit of an old example, but it would be the Mideast and oil. The United States requires a lot of oil, and it used to be uh, the Middle East was the major supplier. Then we had our uh, pipeline system from Alaska and through Canada, so we were able to become, uh, just a few years ago, uh, under the former administration, we were able to become completely independent in our energy production. Now that the pipeline has been shut down, uh, we are back to purchasing oil from the Middle East uh, cartel called OPEC uh, and, and also Venezuela, a country under communism rule. So it's always... Um, good to understand that complementarity is um, one place needs a supply of something and another place has a demand for it. Um, just to be two different places is not enough for interspatial interaction. An example given here is Greenland and the rainforest of Brazil. Well, just because Greenland is a big, cold, icy place up north and Brazil has abundant rainforests does not mean we have complementarity and that we will have spatial interaction occur between the two countries because we have to have a supply of a desirable product in one place and a shortage of demand for the product in another place. Um, here's an example I like. If you live in San Francisco, California, you want to go to Disneyland for a vacation. And um, <clears throat> Disneyland is located in Anaheim, which is near L.A. or Los Angeles in California, in this example. And the product uh, is Disneyland, a destination theme park. Okay, so you want to go from your home in San Francisco to Disneyland, this wonderful destination theme park. Okay, let's talk about this example in talking about transferability. 
transferability is the possibility of transport of the good or product at a cost that the market will bear. In some cases, it is simply not feasible to transport certain goods or people a great distance because the transportation costs are too high in comparison to the price of the product. In other cases where the transportation costs are not out of line with price, we say the product is transferable or that transferability exists. So transferability refers to um, the mobility of a commodity. And spatial interaction occurs only when acceptable costs of an exchange are met. The costs include both time and money. So transferability has two costs that must be met in order for this spatial interaction to occur. Time and money. Using our Disneyland strip example, we need to know how many people are going to Disneyland and the amount of time we have to do the trip. And this includes both travel time and time at the destination. If only one person is traveling to Disneyland and they need to travel the same day, then maybe flying is the best way to do it, correct? It's quicker and you can get there and back very effectively and affordably. <clears throat> um, however, um, if a small number of people are traveling, say you and your parents and maybe your brother or sister, and three days are available for the trip, two days to get there and to get home, and then one day at the park, then driving down in your personal car or renting an Uber or a rental car may, uh, or taking the train may be a realistic option. Um, a car rental would be approximately $150 to $200 uh, for a three-day rental with one to six people in the car. Uh, this does not include gas and insurance. So probably around $150 per person to take um, uh, the train, the Amtrak train, which uh, goes that way. So if you're traveling with a large group of people, uh, maybe 50 or more, maybe it's your, your class at um, Sunday school, at church, maybe it's the Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts um, troop, then it may make sense to just charter a bus, which would be around 2,500 or more uh, dollars, and this would be at least $50 per person. So you can see that um, you have to consider both the time as well as the cost of the uh, trip. The third factor in Ullman's uh, theory uh, is lack of intervening opportunity. Now, a similar product or good that is not available at a closer distance. Okay, the third factor necessary for interaction to take place in the absence or lack of intervening opportunity. There may be a situation where complementarity exists between an area with a high demand for a product and several areas with a supply of that same product in excess of local demand. In this particular case, the first area would not probably trade with all three suppliers. Instead, it would trade with the supplier that was closest or least expensive. Now, when we talk about the trip to Disneyland, um, is there any other destination theme park identical to Disneyland that provides an intervening opportunity between San Francisco in LA? The obvious answer is no, there is not. But if the question was, is there any regional 
theme park between San Francisco and LA that could be a potential intervening opportunity, the answer would be yes. There is a Knott's Berry Farm. Uh, there is a Great America. There's a Magic Mountain in Santa Clarita. These are all regional theme parks located between San Francisco and LA. So intervening opportunities, just to give you your notes here, um, say that the closer opportunities will reduce the attractiveness of interaction with the more distant, even slightly better alternatives. The example they give here is again uh, based on the West Coast. Say there is a ski area in Big Bear. While the snow is not as good in Big Bear as it is in Tahoe, where the powder is super wonderful to ski in, just the fact that Big Bear is much closer for Southern California students means you're more likely to go to Big Bear. It's almost as good as the powder in Tahoe, but it's a whole lot closer. So the intervening opportunity is there. As you can see from these examples, there are many factors that can influence complementarity, transferability, and lack of intervening opportunities. Um, there are many other examples in our daily lives. And when it comes to planning your next vacation, you will understand even more. If you just watch the freight trains rolling through town or see the trucks on the highway or when you ship a package overseas, the, uh, the spots of spatial interaction of the things that we have learned, uh, complementarity, transferability, and the lack of intervening opportunities will certainly come to your mind, I hope. Thank you for your time and attention. I hope that this short video has enhanced your understanding and have a great day.